Hi, I'm Brianna Pobiner, and I'm a paleoanthropologist in the Smithsonian's Human Origins Program. And I'll talk to you today about the ecology of early human scavenging, a study I've done within the larger context of my interest in the origin and evolution of meat eating. We know that early humans were eating meat back at least 2.6 million years ago. <coughs> As in the reconstruction you can see on the left, we know they were eating meat from large animals like this giant extinct elephant. And we know that because we have fossils of those animals with butchery marks like you can see on the top right. Right around that time, we also have evidence of the earliest archeological traces, stone tools, simple cores, and sharp flakes dating back to right around that time. But we don't have evidence for hunting technology until about half a million years ago. That's the age of the earliest spear points that we have right now. So early humans were eating meat from big animals two million years before they were hunting them. So how were they getting that meat? One, one hypothesis is that they were scavenging it. There are two main types of scavenging that have been hypothesized for early humans. The first is called confrontational or sometimes power or aggressive scavenging. And that's reconstructed on the left. The idea is that early humans would have gone in, chased carnivores off of carcasses, and potentially gotten a lot of meat and marrow from this. They also would have put themselves in direct competition with, uh, with um, these large carnivores and potentially become prey, like you can see on the right, with a leopard dragging an early human carcass away. And we do have fossils of early humans with bite marks from carnivores that indicate that this happened not infrequently. The other hypothesis is called passive scavenging. That's basically waiting until carnivores are completely done with their kills, going in and getting the leftovers. A main criticism of the passive scavenging hypothesis is that there may not have been enough meat to make it worth an early hominin's while. So I decided to go out and answer the question, do lions leave leftovers from their lunches? So I'm interested in figuring out um, if there's anything left over by simulating passive scavenging in a modern ecosystem similar to those kinds of ecosystems where our earliest meat-eating meat ancestors lived. So this study was done actually as part of my dissertation at a place called Olpegeta Conservancy, which is a game reserve in central Kenya. You can see the location in the map on the left. Um, I spent nearly seven months here, um, and this place is a savanna ecosystem. The predator community is dominated by lions, and the herbivore community is dominated by zebras, as well as warthog, buffalo, baboon, and impala. After finding out about carnivore kills, I would wait until the carnivores were completely finished. You can see there's a very happy lion in the top right with a distended belly full of meat. Wait till things were safe, come and document what was left over. And unlike my earlier ancestors, I had a four-wheel drive vehicle, which you can see on the bottom right, and I had an armed guard with me at all times when I was out of the car, um, hopefully ensuring that I was less likely to become part of my own sample. So I collected information on 24 kills over this time. You can see the species of carnivore on the left-hand column in the table. I'm only going to talk about the lion sample today. That's my biggest sample. And I separated the prey into two basic categories, standard categories. Larger prey or large prey, which are over 250 pounds, things like zebra and larger antelopes. Smaller prey, less than 250 pounds, usually warthogs um, and smaller antelope. The top right picture is um, a picture of a zebra torso or a zebra rib cage with a lot of meat left on it, as one example. And the bottom right picture is a picture of part of a limb of a young gazelle, which has practically nothing left on it. So how much meat could an early human scavenger eat? It turns out quite a lot. And I'll walk you through this graph. So the X or the horizontal axis is skeletal elements or bones. Um, and the number of bones in my sample are in parentheses above each one. But I've grouped them into four body size categories. So all the way on the left are two bones of the hind limb. Next to that are three bones of the forelimb. Next to that are five bones of the torso. And then all the way to the right are three bones of the um, head and neck. Um, the the y-axis is the proportion of flesh divided into three categories for the entirety of those bones in the sample, and they're coded basically like a traffic light, where green is bulk flesh, yellow is flesh scraps, and red is no flesh. Um, and it turns out that in large kills, you see um, a lot of flesh left. You see a lot of green in here, you see a lot of um, yellow. And so 95% um, of those larger, of those kills, larger kills of lions had at least some flesh left on them, and 50% had bulk flesh. And actually, I'll define what those mean. Bulk flesh is 
more than 10% of the original muscle mass is still there. Flesh scraps are defined as, uh, flesh scrap is less than the size of your hand, but at least two to three centimeters and probably more than a third of a pound. Smaller kills, different story, um, mostly flesh scraps on half of them and then um, hardly, and then basically no flesh on half of them. But if we try to quantify this, if you use a fully fleshed wildebeest on the left, zebra on the right, adult hind limb, you can get about um, 19 pounds from a wildebeest, 50 pounds from a zebra hind limb. But if we're gonna model a defleshed carcass, um, then less than 10% of the weight, you're talking about up to two pounds from a wildebeest, maybe five pounds from a zebra. But that's only a single hind limb. Potentially a defleshed wildebeest can give you 19 pounds of meat, and defleshed zebra can give you 34 pounds of meat. At an estimate of four calories per gram, that's about 2,200 calories from a defleshed wildebeest and over 6,100 calories from a defleshed zebra. That's over 11 Big Macs, and I think this guy probably thinks that was worth it. So have I solved this question? Probably not, but I've contributed some data to it. I think early humans thought that meat tastes great, and I would say that early human scavengers also thought it was more filling. Thank you. Brianna, um, presumably the passive uh, early hominid scavengers uh, had competition from other carnivores. And how are you going to factor that in? The hyenas, the jackals, the vultures, and everybody else who is hanging around the kill. That's a good question. So how would I factor in the fact that early human scavengers would have had competition from other scavengers like hyenas and vultures and, and um, jackals? Well, one thing I did was I actually had some kills that were initially killed by lions and then eaten by hyenas to see if I could make that comparison. They certainly had less flesh on them, but they still had some. So that means that even kind of a secondary passive scavenger potentially would have had maybe some worthwhile meat left to go in. But, but that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, so there's a question for Brianne, Brianna, you. Um, was there any evidence of them cooking their scavenger meat or is it more like zebra tartare kind of stuff? <laughs> it was zebra. The question was, is there evidence for cooking the scavenged meat? Um, not for a while. The earliest evidence for cooking and fire goes back to about 800,000 years. So still not that much earlier than actual hunting technology. It was still a million and a half years of zebra tartare. As a follow-up for Brianna, I also have a question about uh, the hunting technology and when it appears um, and not finding it um, so much earlier. And I guess there's always the question of taphonomy and preservation, are, and are you just not finding it? Um, if it did exist at that time, if they did actually have that technology, what would it, you expect that it would look like, and where would you expect to find it, or how would it appear? And how would you know it if you saw it, basically? So the question is, um, how would you know earlier hunting technology if you saw it, and where would you expect it to appear? Um, so we have um, spear points have very particular morphology and shape. So I feel like if we see stone hunting technology, it would not be hard to recognize. I think the problem is with preservation of wood. So I suspect that there would have been wooden spears back much earlier. We, the oldest wooden spears we have go back to about 400-ish thousand years old. A very special preservation case in Europe where things tend to preserve a bit better. This was kind of in a bog environment. Um, so I suspect that there were potentially thrusting spears at least with just sharpened, basically big sharpened sticks. I don't know how you'd find that in the record though. It'd have to be a very special case. 